I guess I developed a love of traditional music through listening to like old bluegrass records from my grandpa. And then I happened into Tamarack, best of West Virginia, one day and these ladies were playing dulcimer and just I decided that I loved it. I've been playing mandolin for about a year at the time and then that's how I got into old time was going to the Sunday Jam at Tamarack and uh, eventually they introduced me to the festival culture Vandalia Gathering of see Vandalia 2008 was my first festival and uh, after that Clifftop uh, more and more Mount Airy you know just every year different festivals according to my schedule things like that so I guess the authenticity and I knew that it was tied to the region I lived in um, I had grown up listening, I guess, to whatever my parents had on the radio and didn't really care too much for it, but as soon as I heard old-time music, I knew that it was real, and it was real, it was authentic, and it meant something. It meant something to recreate, it meant something to actually play, and it was important to me as opposed to something that was just reproduced, I guess. I give most of my credit to, well, Tish Westman was the f person that I very first met whenever I played dulcimer, and she was my dulcimer mama, as I affectionately call her. Uh, as far as uh, other people that are, you know, names around here, Rachel Eddy was probably my biggest influence and is my best friend. Uh, I talk to them all the time. Uh, but Rachel really started out, I started out admiring them because I was, I think I was 13 at the time whenever we met, and they backed me up in mandolin contest and uh, gave me a record, and I was just, you know, sort of like, here's Rachel, this 25, 20-something-year-old 20 person, here I am like this 13-year-old person, just really looking up to admiring them for, you know, a approaching the music the way they did. So Rachel Eddy uh, was a probably the largest influence on my playing and of course everybody has their favorites that they love to listen to uh, I listen to a lot of Bruce Molsky and um, you know, goodness Jake Crack Bobby Taylor Roger Netherton uh, we all love Gary Harrison uh, Oh goodness, uh, Jeff Sturgeon. Who's where does where does that recording come from? Uh, whose repertoire is that? Kentucky fiddler. John Salyer. I love John Salyer tunes. Those really crooked, squirrely Kentucky tunes. I've I've gone on and on with. Uh, well, I'll mention a contemporary of mine, uh, Sarah Kate Morgan, who's as far as I'm concerned, most fabulous dulcimer player around these here parts. And she and I have uh, both competed and, and played together for years. She's a good buddy of mine, so she's she's an important person to mention too. But we often go back and forth as to which tunes are better, West Virginia tunes or Kentucky tunes. <laughs> well, over the fiddle, well the fiddle's just damn hard. Uh, I've, I'm a multi-instrumentalist. I started off on mandolin and then I learned guitar. Uh, then I was introduced to the dulcimer and really was smitten with the dulcimer. Most people know me as a dulcimer player. In fact, not even not a lot of my friends today still don't know that I play banjo. I'll bring a banjo to a jam and they'll say, what are you doing with that? Where's your dulcimer? It's like, well, I didn't, uh, or I will just have finished well in a banjo contest. And somebody says, well, I didn't know you played banjo. So uh, I learned banjo... Um, sort of as a side project I uh, was looking for a banjo for a friend and ended up buying one for myself at Clifftop and uh, it just was a, a casual thing until I really started to get the hang of it and really took it seriously whenever you go to places like Mount Airy and, and Clifftop I would get the side eye for bringing in a dulcimer so I thought oh well I'll play another instrument so I guess Banjo was more translatable from the skills that I already had, and fiddle's just hard. I've had my go at the fiddle, and um, like I said, self-taught in all the other instruments, and when I go to play the fiddle, I'm like, okay, let's do this thing. And I'm like, oh, nope, just kidding. This thing takes black magic and sorcery now, you know. <laughs> People like to diminish the dulcimer uh, because I think they, have a, they don't have a great enough view of it. They see it as lesser than. A lot of times it's not taken as seriously of an instrument, but um, 
you know, just because you're not chromatic and can switch, I mean, let's talk about the banjo for a minute. The banjo has to retune for every tuning that it's in. I would say that the, the dulcimer is just as restrictive, restrict, restricted as the banjo is, and that's me saying as a dulcimer player and a banjo player, we have to retune as banjo players for every key we go to. It's not so much different from the dulcimer. I slap a capo on it, or I go into a different tuning, and I'm there. So I'm about like a banjo player when it comes to getting in different keys and anything like that. The way that I process tunes, I look at it from a theoretical standpoint, and that's from having been uh, uh, studying music in school. Um, so I just use the, tu the instruments as a vehicle for whatever I'm hearing. Uh, in the beginning, it was easier as dulcimer was my first instrument that I was most proficient at it was easier on dulcimer but now I'm finding more and more things that I thought oh well I use I don't play that one on the banjo that's that's one on the dulcimer I'm finding um, that I'm becoming more proficient on the banjo so it's really not a matter of uh, how I perceive tunes or which one's easier because I, I sort of all view it as the same and use the instrument as a vehicle Probably the fact that you can set in on a jam and, and be hyper perceptive of where everybody is in their musical journey because you can set in with some players that are inexperienced, you can set in with some players that are more experienced than you, and realize that you can all just get together and have a damn good time and not make any pretense about it because everybody is, let's say Bruce Molsky, is, uh, he's learning something just as much as he's playing as to somebody that picked up the banjo six months ago but maybe played the fiddle they're both getting something out of it and and we're doing it out of love we're here in the rain at mount airy and getting shit upon by <laughs> by the gods but not for sport we're doing it and we're all you know avoiding our day jobs and sweating it out camping you know we're not just doing this we're we do, we're not putting up with all this just just for the hell of it, just because we like to be here, just because we're in some random place in North Carolina. People are traveling here from, what would you say, Edwin, was the farthest place people have traveled from uh, here? Japan. Japan. <laughs> okay, yeah, Japan. People are here from Japan because of this music, and that's not out of accident. Get in a jam with people that's better than you. How important would you say that is? It's essential. It's not... Well, if, if you want to be a human, you better, like, drink water and eat. It's, uh... It's like, what would be the best advice that you have for a human? Well, you know, water's kind of important. It's like... No. If you want to grow, you, you... You just have to get... And it's uncomfortable. It can be uncomfortable to be... Especially to be... Um... Vulnerable to say, hey, you know, and I know that there are players better than me and, and not get this sort of wall in front of you that, yeah, I know that there's always going to be a bigger fish. There's always going to be a better banjo player. There's always going to be somebody that you look up to. But if you want to be proficient in this music, you have to... It, the one thing that is beautiful about this music that it is inclusive and that whether if you're a beginner player, like I said, if you're a Bruce Molsky or if you're a whoever you can sit down and play and this music is inclusive and that's what places like this is all about that's that's the crucial part getting to getting to festivals like this and putting yourself in jam sessions if you walk through a jam session and you say hey i really like the way that sounds get in on it yep. it's happened a couple times yeah i was uh, this is a funny story I was walking with my friend at Clifftop, and as it does at Clifftop, it came a random rainstorm just really all of a sudden. And so what you do is you look for the closest campsite to see the, the friendliest face that you know. And so I saw my friend Eli, who's playing bass in on this jam, and it's I just needed to get out of the rain because I had an instrument. And I walk in, we sit down to this group of people that I couldn't see, it was dark, and um, just so happened that uh, I sat down and right here's Brittany Hawes and I'm like oh well there's casually Brittany Hawes right here so. <laughs> so how do you get over moments like that they're people 
they're people. They're not different. They're good. They've been on the journey longer. Like I said, you have people that are on their journey. Some they've, some people have just been on it longer. But they're people, they're approachable. 